What's up, y'all? This is Zach with Living Corporate, and doing something a little bit different. I'm really excited about this. You know, the reality is that we have a ton of content, right? Um, a lot of content because we have plenty of people who want to be on the show, and everything can't get aired as soon as we record it. So you know, we have a bit of a vault. Every you know show that you know has a vault, and so we're gonna let some stuff out the vault for Christmas because we love y'all. And so what you're about to hear is a conversation from our vault as a part of our 12 days of podcast campaign. This is uh, one of those shows. Make sure you check it out. I'm really excited about whoever you're about to hear. <laughs> uh, before we get there, we're going to tap in with Tristan and uh, we'll be back. What's going on, y'all? It's Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting, and I've teamed up with Living Corporate to bring you all a weekly career tip. Today, let's talk about the importance of getting things in writing, aka having your receipts. When I started at my current job, my boss said, you really like to get things in writing, don't you? And while that question is rhetorical, the answer is, uh, yes. I've been burnt in the past, so I've learned from my mistakes, and I wanted to make sure that I always had something to refer to. Getting things in writing ensures not only that everyone is clear, but that you're also covering yourself. There are so many times where getting it in writing comes into play, but I'm going to focus on three. Have you ever led or been on a project where people weren't clear about their responsibilities? That is the worst. But imagine if you put everyone's duties in writing and distributed them out to the team. Some of the confusion wouldn't happen, and even if it does, there's more accountability as everyone was made aware of who was responsible for what and had the opportunity to question it. The next situation where getting it in writing could come in handy is during a meeting with your boss. Sometimes these meetings are scheduled and sometimes they're not, but either way, I always suggest sending a follow-up email summarizing the topics of discussion. No matter if you were discussing a new project you'll be taking on, getting their approval for PTO, or even talking about your next sales incentive, if they don't respond, you'll have a record to refer to at any given point in time, and it puts the onus on them to correct anything you may have misunderstood. Lastly, I know when you get that verbal offer for a new job, you want to quit your current job right in that moment, but do not until you receive that offer in writing. I've seen this go wrong one too many times with candidates just like yourself ending up burned. You don't want to have to retract your resignation and end up looking like a fool. Also, make sure you get any contingencies like a signing bonus or 90 day bonus in writing too so you can hold your employer to it. There are so many instances where getting it in writing could not only help you out, but really could save you from so much turmoil. Do yourself a favor and start documenting things a bit more so you can pull out those receipts. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. So we have Julie Kratz. Julie Kratz is a highly acclaimed inclusive leadership trainer who's led teams and produced results in corporate America for nearly two decades. After experiencing her own career pivot point, Julie developed a process to help women leaders create their winning uh, career game plan. She also has a podcast called Next Pivot Point. Um, she's a TEDx speaker. She's an author, right? So she has written books like Lead Like an Ally through Corporate America, or Proven Strategies to Facilitate Inclusion. That is her, her most recent publication. And uh, yeah, we're thankful to have her. Julie, what's going on? How you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. So let's just get right to it, right? So like, you're a white woman in this space. And I, I'm staying here and I get it. You've been doing it for like 20 years. Let's talk a little bit about like how you got into this work and how race forward your work has become over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I appreciate that question. Yeah, I did. Uh, I, I like to say I served uh, 12 years in corporate America and um I think through those experiences, having some really incredible opportunities to lead teams and develop people, the things I love to do, it was just so stark, you know, back in the early 2000s, back then, just how non-diverse it was. Um, you know, I remember my first moment really being confronted with things weren't equal, like everyone had told me that they were. Uh, that myth of meritocracy was very much alive. And I was confronted with that. And looking at, you know, a big Fortune 50 company I was working for, remember looking at their org chart and having this moment of, huh, all of the vice presidents, all of the group presidents, all of the board 
pretty much all white men. And you just thought, huh, I don't really see myself reflected in this. I'm not sure how I belong or fit into this. And, you know, that happened pretty early. And I remember it was one of those stings you just can't quite shake. And it it continued. You know, I went back to school. I like to say I checked the boxes, did all the things you're supposed to do to fit in in corporate America, Uh, get your MBA, you know, have these uh, development assignments and these stretch assignments and do these things to develop people around you and lead projects and critical parts of the business. And after 12 years, I just remember thinking, there has to be more than this. Like this whole dream of success is corporate America and climbing that corporate ladder. It has to be different for me. And that's really when I pivoted and started my own business, Next Pivot Point, uh, six years ago, really with the intention to help women. You know, I'm a white woman. So I thought, well, how can I help people like me that struggled with things like I did. Um, I kind of had to figure out how to be a leader, how to be inclusive with my team. So that was really much the platform for the first few years, uh, really focused on diversity, but much through a myoptic gender lens. And I want to say three years ago, I had this moment where I was working with a woman of color, my friend Erica, who's a black woman. And we were putting together an event and I remember us kind of, you know, thinking about who we were going to invite and who I was going to invite and who she was going to invite. And you can imagine the lists and what they look like. And I thought, huh, why are all the people I'm inviting white women business owners that also are mothers, you know, just like me, basically, that affinity bias was just clearly in my face. And at that moment, I realized that I needed to do better Um, and the tremendous amount that I was learning by working with folks that were different than me. And one of the, that event that we put on was phenomenal because we had so many different individuals coming together from all different backgrounds, all different perspectives, races and ethnicities. And I thought, huh, maybe this, maybe this turn around allyship and getting men involved as allies at the time when I was focused on, Maybe that's much broader. (laughs) Maybe I need to be a better ally for others. So that's the journey I've been on over the last few years. That was really a couple of epiphany moments along the way, Um, but realizing we all have a chance to be there for people that are different than us, and we really need the majority group included in the conversation so that we can help, that that we can all help carry this forward. Yeah, I'd love to, like, hear more about your perspective on like the role you believe and the responsibility you believe white women have in inequity. Right. So like, which I think is obvious if you listen to living corporate, it's like I have my position is, I think it's um, that. So that way I'm not like bearing the lead or like we're being emotionally honest. I can just like tell you like how I feel. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, my, my, my challenge and my often like genuine frustration is that white women get grouped together um, in statistics around like inclusion, equity, and like diversity slash representation numbers. And it's like, it's not historically accurate or it's not, I don't believe it's intellectually honest to include white women in these spaces in terms of like, like, and I get, I do realize that patriarchy is very real. I recognize that white women have unique challenges that men of all colors do not face. Um, At the same time, I also believe again, like white women are not in the same uh, tier of oppression that certainly black women are and uh, nor sure. black men, right? So I'm trying, I just, I'm curious, like your perspective on that. And like when you talk about the next pivot point um, and also just your own perspective, like how does it inform the work mm-hmm. that you do? Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. And I think, Lumping gender into the diversity conversation has always been a challenge. And you're right. I mean, if 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 we didn't have a patriarchy where it was still, you know, 80% white male led in corporations and government, I mean, pretty much anywhere you look, I don't think we would put women in that conversation. I mean, we're 50% of the population. We're not where we want to be um, with positions of power, with influence, with wealth by any metric. Uh, however, uh, we do have right now more white women CEOs than black male CEOs. 
I mean, no women of color um, CEOs. And so it is interesting to kind of think about the dynamics and these things are always changing. And to think about how you include gender without minimizing the other dimensions of diversity I think is really important. And, and one of the things I like to point out early is there are five kind of key factors. When I talk about diversity and inclusion, I talk about it with gender and race are the big two, you know, that people go to. Um, but including also folks in our LGBTQ plus community, those with disabilities, um, making sure that we're broadening the lens so that it's not just so um, myopic. I, I think when you think about women of color and the intersectional experiences, that's something that's really important to point out that white women certainly cannot understand what it's like to have two, two dimensions of diversity both interacting at the same time. You can't undo your gendered experience from your racial experiences. Those are both very much core to your identity. And that that was something I really wrestled with as a white woman because I thought I understood what it was like to be a woman, <laughs> any woman. And that's simply not the case. Uh, there are different experiences that come into play and intertwine together. They're very complex and, and very hard to even notice because they're so subtle. So I think my, my journey has been really digging into um, one of the things I'm actively doing is diversifying my bookshelf. That's been something that's been core to get on my ally journey. Realizing I was reading books by mostly white women and mostly white men too. Uh, thinking about how can you get better and, and the stories and, and the great work that I'm reading by women of color right now, better understanding their lived experiences. And, and I think as an ally, honoring that I will never understand fully what it's like to live those experiences. I, I couldn't. Empathy does have its constraints. However, how could I better learn and continuously try to understand what it could be like to be to be someone else? And, and when I talk about allyship, that's really what it comes from is not pretending you know someone's lived experiences, not saying uh, that I have answers. It's, it's rather I want to better understand and, and I, 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 I want to know how I can support this conversation in a way that's meaningful and take it forward. Um, and I, I think you raise a really good point around white women historically haven't done a great job of listening. Uh, feminism has been largely led by white women. I mean, we just celebrated women's suffrage under the anniversary. Women of color did not get the right to vote in 1920. Correct. I mean, we don't even know that. You know? Not talk, even our history it's books. Not, it's not in our history books. We don't talk about uh like the own the racism of Susan B. Anthony. Like we don't we don't have these right. conversations, right? And so and like we can talk about like the lack of or like the poor like education that we receive, but like Google is also free, right? And so sometimes when I see these things, it's just like, man, this is just so it's just so inauthentic as it pertains to like there's certain meta narratives that like continue forward, right? Like, you know, like black women and I'm not a black woman, so I'm not trying to speak for black women. I just as as a black man I I have a platform, so I want to at least call speak some truth to power as I see from what I from what I understand and what I've what I've read what I read is like black women have um always been like the fodder by which other people get their freedom. Um and and black men have been as well, but again, like black men are at the bottom of that. Um always yeah. been the means by which we understand um we get suffrage and health care and um uh, the basic things like food jobs like it's like it's and so it's it's exhausting to me when we don't when we're not intersectional and like we i know people have been using that word a lot mm -hmm. like intersectionality but like to me like this is a great example of what intersectionality how how you can use it effectively it's like you're right it is really myopic it's myopic mm -hmm. you, like when you sit back and you say okay what's well, gender or race and it's like well no let's actually if we just like not erasing any other experience or marginalized identities. Like if you combine those two and then think about all the different dimensions in which those two like diversity elements like interact, like you could have some really robust conversations, right? So we talk about the gender pay gap, like uh, we talk a lot about the gender pay gap and it's real. Um, we don't talk about the fact that 
on average, if you look at those same statistics, that white women make more than black men. Right. Like we don't have those conversations like that's that that's yet to we've never had a black men's equal payday. Right. We're just now getting a black women's equal payday. But, you know, like why are we having a black women's equal pay day? There's a lack of attention and uh, intentionality in some of these discussions. I'm, I'm curious mm-hmm. as like as we think about um, this past year. Right. So like the continuous murders of black folks, state sanctioned murders of black folks. Um, on camera i'm really curious about like what that's done to your business and like like how it's continued to shape the things that you do like where do you see your company shifting and going like in the, over the next year or so yeah yeah it's been really I mean, 2020 has been a wild ride for everybody um a big pause button was hit on diversity and inclusion this spring the pandemic and then as we know Uh, George Floyd and the events of the summer certainly brought it right back into the forefront. So it felt like to me, uh, if you were driving a car down a diversity and inclusion road, it was, let's go. We've got goals this year. Let's go. Uh, Wait, stop. (laughs) Pause. Let's not go anywhere. And then, no, now let's hit the accelerator as fast as we can and catch up centuries of inequality. Uh, And then... Of course, uh, as as we sit today, you know, late summer, that conversation is is sparked again and continues to spark uh, with uh, increased tragedies. And and it's so unfortunate that social change takes tragedy, oftentimes, for it to happen. And I think where we're at right now, and especially for my audience in corporate America that I work mostly with, is we're grappling with. You know, we did the corporate statement in June. We made the donations to charitable causes. Uh, we supported our employees doing these activities maybe over the summer. And now what? Because this doesn't seem to be going away. And, and that's intriguing to me that we like, that white people still think that this will go away somehow. Um, the complacency, especially in C-suites, um, some of the most challenging conversations I've had have been, um, we can't prioritize this year. Uh, it is important, but we don't have a budget, which to me means that's not important. You would never not fund anything Correct. else in your business Correct. that was important. Uh, and those are really hard conversations to have. But I would say overwhelmingly, what I'm seeing right now is people coming to the conversation and staying there. And they're not sure how to stay, right? Because they they read the books, you know, they listened to the podcasts, uh, they watched some TED Talks, they listened to podcasts like yours, they feel informed. But saying something and maybe showing up at a protest or being vocal on social media isn't something I personally feel comfortable with. Not me personally, but <laughs> white people in general have told me this. And I don't know how to show up. And, and corporate America likewise is wrestling with how do we continue to accelerate this conversation when we're not diverse? Uh, and, and the question I like to ask is like, why is this important to you? Why is diversity, equity, inclusion important to you? If you haven't defined that, you're, you're not going to do the hard work required to make it happen. And the the answer, overwhelmingly, that I'm getting in strategy sessions that I'm leading with leadership teams is, it's because of what happened this summer. That's why we care about this. And honestly, I'd love to hear your take on this. I, I'd prefer people be honest about that. Like, let's be honest that, that you needed a wake-up call to understand that racism still exists. Let's not pretend we've always cared about this when you didn't. You didn't. Yeah. Care. No, I no, I I agree. You know, I I think it's important. I think it's important for folks to be honest. That you have to at least be honest with yourself, right? I mean, I think you know when you think about um, you think about like the history of like race relations is like, oh no, it's almost like black folks have been able to see. You know, in certain ways, black America or black black people can be the mirror that white people don't want to look into, right? Like, mm-hmm. so yeah. it's like this idea of like. It's all this shuffling like around like the language that people use, even bias, diversity of thought, um, 
assume positive intent. Like they're very like passive, like frankly, like white supremacist terms that people use to shield and um, kind of like cushion the racism that is prevalent every single day. And so, yeah, you know, I'm appreciative of when people are honest about why it is that they care and why it is that they like, why, like why this moment, what I am not, you know, what, what, uh, what annoys me in these moments or what, I'm sorry, beyond that, what infuriates me in these moments is that, you know, it's easy to react to the extreme violence that you see on camera. Right. What it's not easy to do is to really examine the behaviors within your own organization and examine like yep. and interrogate the ways that you uphold systems that create disparate impact for your black and brown employees. And like, yep. that's really like where I've yet to see anyone go anyone. Like there was a really prominent tech uh, consulting firm that like put out some diversity data um, and, and they're getting, you know, they're, they're getting like, they're getting applause and, and pats on the <laughs> back for that. And it's like, first of all, you don't get credit for <laughs> taking the cover off of a mess that you made to the data, <laughs> the data that you presented, it's still not transparent, right? Like, are still pro- <laughs> right. you know you're what still I mean? trying to like, architect the story. You're still architect. You're still arch. That's a great, that's a great, you're still architecting the story. And I think there's a lot of that still happening right today where it's like, you know, because, because folks are scared, like there's still, there's still fear of litigious, ri- aversion to, lit- to litigious risk, which, you know, it's a separate discussion. But the point is, is that like what I'm really curious about is just like when are we going to have the actual discussion and like what needs to happen? So like do all the black and brown folks just need to quit or like do we need to like <laughs> right? like what needs to happen? Like what needs to happen right. for you to actually take this serious and for us to have an actual discussion about the behaviors that you propagate, the things that you don't hold people accountable for and the things that you turn a blind eye to that you're complicit in. Like when do we have that conversation? Because it's clear that like having th- these discussions, these statements and all this other stuff isn't working. So like what, yeah. what's the next step? You know what I mean? Like, I'm curious when it comes to like the discussions you're having with these uh, leadership organizations mm-hmm. is like, what, what do they see as next? Yeah. It's still a lot of what you said, unfortunately. It, you know, a couple of things I think that actually really work. And, and there's so few case studies of this working to pull from. It's so troubling as, as somebody passionate about this, like we are, to watch corporate America just continue to eke by and not do anything, to not really change. Like you said, systemic change. And systemic changes that are needed for people to feel fully included and feel a sense of belonging in their work, which is paramount to someone's success, it's not being addressed. What is happening, and, and this might be kind of a baby step, a bridge, um, of what I think is happening and what will continue to happen for the next five years is organizations were very surprised by what happened this summer. Even the more progressive ones did not know how to respond appropriately. And I don't think that felt good. You know, it was like, oh, we're caught. We look bad. We can't even make a statement because we don't have legs to stand on with this. And I think fear, (laughs) fear is not my favorite motivator, but fear does work. And that fear of it happening again, and much like it is, again, surfacing, and it will continue to surface. I don't want to look bad again. I don't want to have nothing to say again. I don't want to feel inauthentic and have a lawyer write a statement next time. So we're going to do the work. So so that's one. I think an increased level of commitment. Now, that's still not the action needed to support systemic change, but it is a catalyst for that. Second is having long-term DEI plans. So I'm starting to see this. We don't just want to have you come in and speak. This is, you know, pre-COVID, that's all I did. It was come in and speak and teach people about how to be an ally, rah, rah, leave, and wonder what happened. Now it's what diversity, equity, inclusion mean to us, why it matters, and how we're going to go about this intentionally and consistently, not just now, but into the future. That has been a huge change that I've seen very recently of this is not a one-time bias training type of event or ally training type of keynote. 
This is an intentional series of consistent activity. And and the third thing I'd offer is we are going to hold our leaders accountable. So the word accountability and metrics have been used quite a bit in the DEI conversation. But organizations have been very slow to show their numbers, much like the organization you were just talking about, to be public with it. Um, or even to have the dashboards available internally. I mean, this is readily available HR data. It's not hard to get, but there hasn't been transparency. Now with measurement, just like we would any part of our business that matters, if it's important, we would measure it, we would invest in it. Having your leaders directly accountable for the representation on their teams and that they have to get better, even if you're at 5% right now to verse. You have an opportunity to be better, and we expect you to be better. So when you bring a slate of candidates in or a slate of candidates for promotion and they're not diverse, we will challenge you. And these are the behaviors that starts to reinforce systemic change in behaviors and the employee experience that supports inclusion. So that, 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 that's what I'm seeing now. I'm, I'm optimistic, but very cautiously so, because I agree this knee-jerk reaction is it's exhausting to people that have been here all along yeah you know i'm curious like you know there's a growing sentiment of black brown and white folks who don't believe that white people should be leading the charge when it comes to this type of work and that like the very presence of white people doing like dei work is racism now clearly you do this work Um, (laughs) i'm curious to get your perspective on like One, your perspective on that take. And then two, what do you think are ways that you as a white person in this space can then also can be a practical ally to black and brown uh, DEI business owners, consultants, thought leaders, so on and so forth? Yeah, no, it's it's a very uh, candid question that I'm asked quite honestly, very often. And I've struggled with that. I mean, when I'm went through that pivot in my business and saw an opportunity to be, you know, strive to be an ally in race, that, well, what am I supposed to, you know, who am I to show up in this conversation? Why my skin's white? Uh, And that's how I start out. If I do anything on race, it's, it's much from a privileged perspective of educating white people perspective on it. I I honor that and say, I do have white privilege right from the get go. My skin is white. Uh, And so I want everyone to know I'm very aware of that. And I will talk from that perspective while also my own ally journey and, and tools I know that we need for white folks to get included in this conversation. So it's, it's, it's one that has to be led, I think with vulnerability, but also with collaboration um, with partners. So I had, um, I had a recently a client request, topic of intersectionality. And I thought, yeah, you know, I've got content on that. I've read books on it. Sure. I, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, like we, there's great stuff out there. I can, I can speak to it. And I thought, hmm, this doesn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, right. So I have a couple of partners, collaboration partners, um, one of which we do a, a podcast for kids um, on inclusion called the Inclusion School Podcast. And I have another partner that we've done racism, um, anti-racism workshops the last few years. And so I asked my partner, Eric, I said, hey, I think this is one that would make sense for us to do together. And luckily the client agreed, you know, but it was just, it's recognizing those moments where I'm being stretched beyond my subject matter expertise or lived experiences and where I can partner with others uh, and be supportive there. But I get it. I had a client uh, recently that said, you know, we didn't want to hire Julie at first because she was a white woman. And I appreciated her honesty with that. Quite, It, it was nice to know that that was a hesitance in her decision and for her team to know that we we, we did uh, think about race in, in this conversation. And my response is always this. Uh, I understand I, I am white. I may not be the right fit, again, based on the subject matter at hand. Yeah, you know, I my position on it is that white women, white people in this space are by function of white supremacy necessary to progress the work. Um, so uh, because of white supremacy and uh, just historically white people not listening to black and brown people, not valuing their perspective as equal as their own, 
you need to have a white person um, who is seen as a human being who can speak uh, these things um, on top of that, you know, there's various levels of desire and and frankly, just capacity in this moment for black and brown folks, specifically in this moment, black folks to have these conversations. And um, and so you and so the support is needed. I think where I'm challenged is uh, white folks being in charge right so like being the de facto yeah. voice like that's where i'm like okay this is this isn't real because you have no you don't understand this space you're not able yeah. to speak to this and frankly you know there's a case for every organization that has a diverse inclusion office that's been led by a white person in this moment like there's a case for their for their jobs to be evaluated because we're clearly seeing like a systemic failure of like this work to date because it just has not been explicit enough in talking about racial equity, organizational and social justice and really holding leaders accountable for their behavior. Cause if it was, we wouldn't be having all of these like internal uprisings, company to company, like those things would not yeah. be happening. So I think, I think that's my, that's my, my, my position. So I'm curious, like, you know, talk a little bit about like, how you choose to collaborate, what things you choose to support. I believe that you supported Living Corporate's Kickstarter. Like you do things, like there's things that you give and time, time and energy and effort that you give to different things. I'm curious, like what informs your support of like black and brown people? Like talk to me about practical ways that you practice allyship in your life. Yeah. Um, what ways are you still looking to like expand your allyship? Yeah, it's a big, a big opportunity, I think, for me to to take a step back and think about, yeah, where do I put my money, right? Like what, what businesses am I supporting, um, black and brown organizations that I can support more of, small business owners that I can support more of that, of course, have been adversely affected by everything this year, much more so than um, white businesses. So that is something, finding meaningful ways, yeah, to give to Kickstarter cam- campaigns to uh, you know, reevaluate how I'm investing money. Um, so these are things that are all kind of top of mind for me. But I, I would say the biggest thing I've learned in my ally journey is to to really amplify the voice. You know, your point earlier about passion fatigue, it's real. My friends of color through the summer, just reaching out to them and asking how they're doing and really wanting to listen and understand and not rely on them to educate me about things I can obviously watch and understand myself, but really out of a place of care and wanting to be supportive to them and taking the content, whether it's TED Talks like Color Brave, that's amazing, or Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man video series, like finding good things out there. I just read Austin Channing Brown's I'm Still Here. Oh my gosh. Like finding ways to elevate and share those resources with people in the black and brown communities that are already have great content, great ideas. Uh, if I can be a part of amplifying that and pointing white people in that direction to help them diversify, you know, the messages that they're hearing about this. That's that's huge, I, I think, for me, as far as my goals as an ally, not to be the voice. And I think when we talk about being an ally and what you said earlier about like, when white people take charge of the conversation, yeah, that's so frustrating. <laughs> Here we are again. This is supposed to be about us. And you're like, seriously? You already have enough. Um, and that's not the point. An ally shares power with right? It's power with, not power over. So if you have power, share it with somebody, give it to somebody else, pass that power forward to help them understand. Because I just have a different reaction. My friends of color will say, when you post something, Julie, it's very different how people perceive when you post it versus when I do. Not fair, not fair at all. But I can post controversial stuff and I don't get, you know, I, I luckily haven't had a lot of trolling on my stuff. Yeah. I still do, but sometimes it just was weird. But most of my friends of color say, I just don't feel comfortable posting that. Or I've learned over the years, this was something uh, so hard for me um, early on this summer. Yeah. Friends shared 
a comedic element on, on white saviorism. And it was just a, a montage that was hilarious, just about all the things white people do to save the day, you know, in, in movies. It was funny because it was true. And she shared it with me and she said, I hesitated all day to hit the send button on sharing this with you. And I thought, what? Why? Like, why wouldn't you want to share that with me? Of course, I, I would love that. And she said, I've learned over the years to tiptoe around white people. And that, Correct. Mm, that Correct. really hurt. Well, it's true. Like, it, it's, it's, it's true, right? It's like. To signal to others that it's not about me, too, at the same time. We're conditioned based on past experiences to not do things a certain way and to tone police like so many women of color are taught. So it's still like, I think with this, it's still so hard because it's so long, this journey. You know, I'm still here. I just read that book. And at the end, she talks about how it'll be several generations before we achieve equality if we ever do. And to know that we're looking our kids in the face, knowing that they're going to be up against some of these same obstacles, hopefully not all. And their children will be, and probably their children will be. That's hard. Uh, And I I think knowing that's why the burden cannot fall on the most marginalized to support the conversation about racism and about equality. That's not fair. Right. It's not. It's not. And I think, like, I think about... I think about this moment. I think about the fact, like, so you talked about like sharing power. I think here, I think that's really like the biggest thing is that I think for the past, what I, I, I do believe, right. And I'm not a sociologist um, and nor am I like a trained historian. There, there are sentiments out there, which I, I tend to agree with that. There has been a fear for centuries by the majority of what black people will do if they ever get so much power. Like, and so you'll, and you see that, like you see like little micro versions of that. In the workplace, when black people sit together or go out to lunch for lunch together or have meetings together or um, whatever the case is. And there's like questions about what are you, what's the intention of this or, you know, y'all need to break it up, whatever the case is. Right. Like that's that's been an actual complaint that people have um, documented in terms of what employers have said to them. And I think there's like this belief, again, that like, you know, black and brown people, marginalized people will take that power and do to others what's been done to them. And I think for me, I I do believe there needs to be a deeper dive on the discussion and like examination of organizational power and a willingness to really cede to that. Because if you don't cede power, then you're not going to have any change. Like the reason why we're at where we're at from a race relations perspective in this country is because white people determine the pace of it, right? Like white people have the power. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you think about like even organizations, you know, you you look at this, you look at these data sets, organizations, you know, they, they don't have representation. Like, and I'm not even talking about the senior, senior executive level. Like, I, I think that that that's also a gimmick to a certain extent to kind of avoid the more practical challenging conversations of why don't we have black and brown people at like just like the mid level manager level, like or entry level manager level. We don't even have black and brown folks at that level. So let's not we don't have to talk about the senior, most senior levels because frankly a lot of people like there's only like six of those spots like (laughs) a lot of those people a lot of people aren't going to get in those positions so you know okay cool like we can talk about that i'm not i'm not dismissing that but like you only have like three percent representation of managers who are black and brown and so like they're and like examining and being honest and getting being willing to be uncomfortable as the reasons as to why right because if you had if you had if that two percent went to like twenty percent then all of a sudden your leadership culture would change right Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, like, I think for me, it's like I'm I'm always thinking about power in turn in, in the context of DEI. Brittany J. Harris, prominent um, thought leader, uh, uh, vice president of uh, the Winners Group, uh, which is a, a fairly, fairly prestigious diversity and inclusion consulting firm. Um, she said, you know, power is the silent P in DEI work. Right. Like it's it's what we don't talk about. But really undergirds a lot of these discussions and undermines a lot of these efforts, right? It's, it's, it's the hand, the invisible white hand that shifts and determines ERGs and who sits on them, that shifts and determines employee policy and practice and, and um, determines what the makeup of the, of your corporation's legal counsel is, which informs how they even interpret risk and how they even interpret things to, to watch out for, right. And language, 
Um, and so that, the, you know, I, I think that's a great point. Um, I think I think to your other point, you know, as it pertains to uh, discussion and who should own these conversations, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Black and brown people can't be responsible for pulling themselves up by bootstraps that don't exist. Right. Like, you know, we can't, we, you know, put the fire out that you started. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. We can have like we can help. You know what I'm saying? But the labor needs to fall on you because this is a problem that y'all made. I think, you know, this moment as we talk about and we talk through like just the, the, the history and formation of this nation, I think Hamilton kind of brought this out inadvertently because Hamilton is like really, really cool American fan fiction. But like it sparked discussion, which I know people don't necessarily like um, all the time. But like on Twitter, folks, the, the, then, you know, all these YouTube videos start popping up about the historicity of oppression and like some of them were old, but like the algorithm kind of kicked it back up or whatever. So anyway, the point is like, it was interesting because folks starts, you know, the idea that like America was essentially like was a slave colony. Like it was a plate, like there was a, when you look at the structure and formation of things, economically, everything, of course you look at uh, Nicole Hannah Jones's 1619 project, but just like the very structure of America was built upon oppressing mm-hmm. non white men and women and of course, exploiting white women as well. Um, white women were com- were in certain ways complicit and participatory in that, but like the very system was built for that. And so, like, and really, as you look at the behaviors and things of today, like, there's still an underlying fear of like, how do we keep control and power? Yeah, over it's these like, people. We'll give you a little bit, but don't take too much. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. We'll give you a we'll give you a sliver of like this icing. But the cake is still ours and yeah. and and we control the knife and um, and the portion sizes, too. So, like, you know, <laughs> if what you I do mean? anything wrong, you're not invited anymore. <laughs> exactly. So it's it's not it's it, it becomes it becomes yeah. like ceremonial and performative. And I think for me, what's just getting like exhausting, like so we're recording this episode um, on August 29th. So, you know, it's it's a particularly and, I, you know, we talked about this, right? We talked like right before we recorded. I was like, man, you were like, I don't know if we, we're going to have this episode. And it's like, you know, like I want to have this episode because. I want to be emotionally present for this moment. I want to be honest and I, I want, I want us to have a frank conversation. Right. I think, mm-hmm. you know, it's just so much, so much loss. Yeah. And, um, and I think 2020 has stripped bare a lot of the systems and things like a lot of the covers that um, the gentility from the things that have been oppressive for several decades that, we, that for my generation and my parents' generation, um, my dad is 50, he turns 56 this year. And he and I had a conversation and he was like, look, he's like, he's like, this is the most afraid. He's like, I grew up in, I was born in the, in 1964. I grew up in the late sixties, early seventies. Like I re- I remember, I remember walking around in the seventies. Mm-hmm. He's like, this is the most hostile <laughs> and like the, the most palpable I've seen and like really felt like tensions and fears. One of the most in my life. And we talked about like, just this moment. And I think that you know, for me, and a lot of other black and brown folks, black folks specifically, is that this moment continues to like just highlight the jig, man, like just the capitalistic, patriarchal, white supremacist jig of America. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm really looking forward to the day where like these systems and institutions that have yet to still, even as we speak, really make any type of internal efforts to change um, when those things get called to account. And it's, but I think for me, Julie, it gets depressing. And like, that's why when I bring up the date, it's just depressing because it's like, it seems like everyone that loves us, when I say us, I mean, black and brown folks uh, are getting taken away. And the folks that continue to oppress and wage war on us are still here fighting stronger than ever. And I'm just like, I don't understand. Like, it's just such a confusing time. And, you know, I look on these these major publications, they're writing puff pieces about organizations that aren't going to write things. Um, but it's, it's just more of the same. Right. And yeah, so smoke and mirrors, a yeah. lot of smoke and mirrors. And I'm and it's it's depressing. It's depressing. And so I, I, I'm curious as to, of course, I'm not expecting for you to have this filled, carry the level of trauma or hopelessness that maybe a lot of people <laughs> who listen to this yeah. um, carry. But I'm curious as to like, if you've had similar discussions and then also like how or if you plan on like empathizing with those feelings more when it comes to the work that you do. Yeah. I mean, it's something I've struggled with guilt. I experience it 
you know, I, I'll, I'll read, you know, I can't watch the videos of things that happen. It just, it, I, I just can't, it, it personally is just really hard for me. And you say the things, and that I happen, cry. when you say the things that happen, you're talking about black people. Getting George, oh, George Floyd. Yeah. yeah. The, the shooting. Yeah, I just personally, it's, it's very hard for me to watch. And, and that's part of my approach. I don't have to watch it. I, I know that. And when I do watch it, I don't see myself in that position, right? I, I see myself as probably somebody that would have been recording it on the sideline. So it's a totally different experience for me versus a black person, especially a black man watching that video. Having said that, though, raising children living in a country where racism is prevalent feels viscerally wrong to me. And one of the things that white women do is we get emotional about it and make it about us. And I never want to do that, right? I, I, I want to step into the conversation and honor the people that are here that are really struggling and, and being most adversely affected. But I feel it too. I feel the compassion fatigue. But I think, I think as far as the future goes, and at least two things that people can really do to challenge the systems individually. And one, in the feedback and a lot of the research shows, you know, voting, right, informing education, things like that, systemic problems start there. But I would say really think about your local community. What can you do in your local school system, in your local community where you have greater influence, right? Nationally, statewide, it's a little harder, right, unless you've, you've got a microphone like you do. But I think it's harder sometimes for people to think how I can be there beyond in a big way. Don't think about it so big. Think about how you can lead diversity efforts in your kid's school, um, you know, support local activities to address redlining, um, systemic issues affecting black and brown people. Just get involved in your local community. You can make a huge impact there. Mm-hmm. You need to pepper them with information, bring them in. What if we started to see that number be more equal with women, with people of color? What an opportunity to kind of go from the bottom up and top down to get to that middle layer. And education is required to decrease discrimination and increase inclusion. So educating those people, whether that's your brother, your spouse, your friend, the white guy you play basketball with, whatever it is, I think that's a really important point that we're missing in this conversation is really an overt focus on white men that yeah. have the power, have the influence. Uh, that's really, I think, what's missing in, in this conversation and on the corporate side is we're not willing to say, like, that's where we really need to focus. I, that's where the power is. Mm-hmm. How do we educate those folks? Julie, this has been a great conversation. Um, man, I, I really appreciate your uh, availability having this discussion. Uh, Shout out to all the people out here, well-intentioned, leveraging their access and power to make meaningful systemic changes. We challenge every white person that listens to this uh, that you're not doing enough. I don't care what you're doing. You can always do more. You can always do more. I can do more. I always always think about that, too. Like We can always do more. I love it. I love it. No one has arrived. Um, And so, you know, it's a journey. um, And I'm thankful to have you here. Till next time, y'all. This has been Zach. Peace. All right, and we're back. Listen, um, again, I hope this holiday season is treating you well. I know that the holidays are not the most joyous time for everybody. I hope that you're able to find some peace and some restoration during the season as we get ready for hopefully what will be a better new year. Until next time, this has been Zach. Make sure you give us five stars on that good old Apple podcast. We'll catch y'all later. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.